cost-benefit analysis of four types of policies. Now, a cost means any burden, monetary or non-monetary, real or perceived, that a group must bear. So for instance, we're going to look at the same three programs when we look at benefit. Um, a federal child care program is a cost because it's paid, through by ta it's paid for by taxes. Busing to achieve school desegregation. There's two different types of costs. Not only is it a cost to the taxpayers, but there's a cost to the children who may spend a long hours every day on the bus. Third, there's tariffs, higher prices for goods. That's a cost. Now, when we apply benefit, which means any satisfaction, monetary or non-monetary, real or perceived, that a group will enjoy from a policy, then that is the, the, the qualifying definition of a benefit. So let's look at the same three things. A federal child care program means lower child care costs for parents. But the rest of us are paying. Busing to achieve school desegregation. It's an improvement in opportunity. But it can also, and it can also mean greater racial harmony. Uh, as, as different types of kids get exposed to each other. And then for tariffs, there's more jobs for workers, there's more profit for businesses, but only those businesses that are involved in the tariff, which makes it kind of an interesting uh, uh, conundrum, uh, especially when you see both sides. You don't want people to lose their jobs, but you don't want people to also pay higher prices for things. So when we look at uh, at cost benefits, you're going to see uh, you're going to see these these different monikers. Why they distributed, narrowly concentrated, and so when we do that, there's four different ways of, of doing it. First one would be just uh, why they distributed costs. So that would be let's get rid of this here because we don't need that at least not yet. So why they distributed costs are the costs borne by everyone. They're borne by everyone. So that would be income tax, social security tax, farm subsidies. Then there's narrowly concentrated costs. And these are things like factory air emission standards, high capital gains taxes for the wealthy, gun control regulations, for instance. Then there's widely distributed benefits. So you'll see that under WD. Uh, Social Security benefits, strong national security, clean air, federal highways would all be widely distributed benefits. Nearly concentrated benefits would be a little bit different. Farm subsidies, tariffs, exemption from antitrust legislation. Um, so when we, go, when we run through this small presentation, that's what the WDNC, WDNC benefits and costs <coughs> stand for. Excuse me. So let's look at the first type of uh, policy. We call this majoritarian. Now, majoritarian policies are the type that come under widely distributed costs and widely distributed benefits. Why is that? Well, first and foremost, if we look at first example, Social Security. Social Security is virtually paid for by everyone as they contribute into the system. And then virtually everyone receives it, which is the way it is now. It may not be that way in the future, but certainly it is the way it is now. And national defense is the same way. <coughs> Excuse me. Everybody pays, but because we're fairly safe, everybody also benefits when it comes to national defense. Now, when we analyze this, when we analyze this, we can say that um, that majoritarian policies are not usually dominated by interest groups because virtually everyone benefits. And if that is true, why would an interest group use their scarce resources? Because even AARP, you can say, has scarce resources. They're not finite. They're not infinite, excuse me, they are finite. Um, they're not going to use those scarce resources to lobby for policies that everyone will benefit from. Interest groups will benefit whether or not they devote resources to lobbying. So therefore, there's a lack of incentive to participate. 
it's like the uh, the parallel um, in in, in uh, interest groups, the free rider problem. People don't join the AARP because most likely they're going to enjoy most of the benefits anyways. So why join? <coughs> now, when a policy is adopted and people are convinced that the benefits are worth the cost, debate usually ends. On a, on a national level, debate usually ends, and the program tends to steadily grow, and perhaps even becomes what's known as, like Social Security, a sacred cow. And what's a sacred cow? It's not a cow from India, but it's used in the same way. You can't touch it. You can't harm it. Otherwise, you, you suffer, you certainly fear, but you suffer from the wrath of voters. And Social Security, and somewhat Somewhat uh, to, to the same, to the same token, Medicare is also held in in high esteem as a sacred cow. Now, our second group of policies comes under what's known as interest group policies. I'm just shorthanding uh, uh, interest groups as IG. Now, these involve narrowly concentrated costs and narrowly concentrated benefits. So, an example of this would be tariffs. Remember, tariffs are put in place to save jobs or to save an industry by making uh, competitors, usually competitors from outside the country, um, by making them pay an extra charge when they bring their product in, thus making the American product equal in cost, or at least theoretically equal in cost, to the foreign product that's, that's being brought in. Another example would be antitrust exemptions which um, for some of you, this is your sport, baseball has an antitrust exemption. Note that unlike football, unlike ice hockey, basketball, there's been no competing leagues to challenge the uh, national or American baseball leagues. <coughs> the NFL has gone through the WFL, the USFL, uh, ice hockey had the World Hockey Association, uh, basketball had the ABA, in the 60s, 60s and 70s when I was growing up. But you notice that baseball never has because baseball enjoys antitrust exemption. And so that's what happens when, uh, when an industry is protected. Now, when we analyze this, we look at, at uh, interest group policies as those type of policies that tend to be fought over by interest groups. The affected parties are small enough the potential costs and benefits are great enough that it warrants the interest groups to get in, to, to get involved, to get interested, to protect their interest. Now the third type of policy is what we call client policies. These involve widely distributed costs and narrowly concentrated benefits. An example of this would be farm subsidies, airline and trucking regulations. All of these raise the cost for consumers. That's what we call them widely distributed costs. I've used this before in class, the dairy farmer, for instance. I'm a big supporter of dairy farms. But <coughs> because of changes in the consumer marketplace, dairy farmers are producing far more milk than can be consumed by 315 million Americans. But we want the dairy farmers to stay in business. So the farm subsidy gives the dairy farmers a boost by providing for a cost floor. And what we mean by that is, notice when you go into the stores that you cannot find a gallon of milk for under $3. The cheapest I've actually seen is $2.98. Now you can buy a double pack, I think, at Costco for a little bit less than that, but not much. Costco actually tried back in the 90s to really lower the price of milk and they got they got their hands slapped by the state of California because the state of California offers farmers a, a, a price floor. And I believe that price floor is something like $2 a gallon. So if a, and I think the state also sets a retail price for milk. Milk is usually, a, a, in, in a sense, a loss leader. The, the stores aren't going to make a lot of money on it. But what this does is it provides 
for uh, a, a constant revenue stream for the dairy farmers. The stores really don't lose any money on it. Uh, and consum consumers bear the brunt of the cost of those farm subsidies. If the market was involved, milk would probably be somewhere between a dollar and a dollar fifty less than what it sells for now. There would be fewer dairy farmers uh, in business in the state. That is the downside, and that was actually one of the arguments used by dairy farms after they moved out of the San Fernando Valley and out of Chino to the southern San Joaquin. That now, if they did not leave subsidies in place, then the farms were going to have to move to places like Nevada or, uh, or Arizona, and um, milk would have to be trucked in, thus raising the cost that way. And the state legislature bought it. Now, airline and trucking regulation works in a sense the same way. But in this case, when I was growing up, it didn't matter if you were, if you were uh, flying on Braniff, Continental, United, Pan Am, TWA, American, um, Northwest Orient, uh, Piedmont, you all pretty much say, paid the same price, regardless of the airline you were flying when you were flying from Los Angeles to New York, because the government set the fare structure for flying, which meant that flying now, as much of a hassle as it can be, is far cheaper than what it was in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s until deregulation came into effect in, in the early 1980s under Reagan. Trucking regulation is this, worked the same way, uh, in that. Uh, and that there uh, are not broad rates set by the, trunk, the trucking companies or by the states or by the federal government. It's now the market involved. So as we analyze client policies, there's a strong incentive for the interest groups to participate. Groups will receive the benefits, but the costs will be spread out to everybody. Hence, the airlines were the beneficiaries of regulation, and the taxpayers took it in the you-know-what by paying much higher prices. And that led to usually profitable years for the airlines um, because they knew that the market would generally be stable and, and they could anticipate their, their revenues. The 1970s though were hell when it comes to that because uh, suddenly fuel was no longer a, uh, a predictable item and then comes deregulation and you can see that there's a there's basically no legacy airlines left the way they, they started the, the, uh, the deregulation period. Now that American is merging with US, US Air and United <coughs> had merged with Continental. Now, the, uh, the other interesting thing here is that since the costs are so widely distributed, most people drink milk in some form, whether it's right from the glass, or as part of a meal, or as part of the uh, part of the ingredients that go into a meal, we all use it, and so therefore there's relatively um, a small cost to all the consumers, and so and sometimes it's so small that the cost payers, you and me, are sometimes unaware that they're even paying for the costs. Most people are unaware that dairy that, that, that Dairy merchandise could be much cheaper uh, if uh, if there wasn't a farm subsidy keeping the price inflated above what it, what uh, uh, what what the market demands. And the other thing about farm subsidies for dairy farmers it, is that there's nothing in the law that says maybe you should watch how many animals you have. There's no in, there's no d or what we call disincentive to keep your herds small. Um, the herds are large, larger, and if you're producing more milk than is than, than is consumed, then you've got a, a problem. You either have to do better marketing or you've got to reduce, reduce your herds instead of relying on the, uh, the public to subsidize your business. Now, some of these, some of these, uh, some of these um, interest groups, sorry about that, the lights went out just for a second. Since interest groups benefit so much from these, they're said to be a client of the related federal agency. Hence, I put uh, a little love badge over here between the dairy farmers and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is what the USDA stands for. I guess I, I guess I should have made that in red, huh? It's pretty bad. Anyways, let's go on to our 
final one. And we call this entrepreneurial policies. Now these involve narrowly concentrated costs and widely uh, distributed benefits. An example of this would be uh, consumer product safety legislation. So for instance, a baby crib is required to have uh, railings, the rails that go, uh, that, that kind of perform the, the protective wall to keep the infant from falling out, uh, closer together um, to where it's a higher cost for the producer to keep the baby from, let's say, getting its head caught and killing itself. Um, and another example of, of narrowly concentrated costs and widely distributed benefits would be airline deregulation. The cost was to the airline. The benefit was to all the consumers who, flo who flew. And nowadays, far more people fly than in the 1960s or 1970s because it's relatively cheaper. Um, now, when we analyze this, we know that there's strong incentive for uh, for the for the potential cost-paying group to participate. The consumer products uh, companies want to be part of the system so that they don't have to pay any more for the implementation of that legislation than they have to. And prospective beneficiaries may find that um, the widely distributed benefits are too small to work hard for. The flip side of this is that sometimes, the, even though the, the benefits are widely distributed, there's no real interest in helping the, uh, the people who bring the issue to the table. There's no real impetus to help them because most people, even though the, the widely distributed benefits, the, the beneficiaries um, feel that the end result is too small to, make a, to really make a difference. Now, because of A, the strong incentive, and B, the prospective beneficiaries finding uh, the widely distributed benefits too small to work, um, politics or policies uh, that wind up in this category are often defeated by the concerted efforts of cost-paying interest groups. So note the issue over guns. The, there's an impetus for some sort of gun control, and yet, the manufacturers of guns are pushing back for the most part. Uh, and they may wind up winning this battle against those who, uh, who, want, uh, um, who want some boundaries put on the usage of, of firearms. Now, despite this, despite this, uh, this concerted effort by those who will, uh, who will bear the cost of this, um, the strong efforts of these people sometimes, because there's someone willing to stick their neck out to, uh, on behalf of the unconcerned and the unaware, they win. And these people are called policy entrepreneurs, like I have right here. And the best policy entrepreneur, the most widely known, even though he's less known uh, nowadays, is Ralph Nader. Uh, he was big in the 60s, 70s, 80s, may have cost Gore the election in 2000, but 13 years later, he's kind of a name that's really only known by those in the, in the older generation. But he was a policy entrepreneur. He went after GM for its supposedly unsteady car called the Corvair. And he actually got GM to stop production on the, on the Corvair in the early 60s. He said it was, I think he wrote a book called The Unsafe at Any Speed. And that's an example of a policy entrepreneur beating the concerted efforts of Ford, GM, and, and Dodge, and and, uh, uh, or Chrysler at the time, on Dodge. And so consequently, um, consequently, you know, he won. But that's, it's, it's rare. We have to admit that it's rare. It's, it only occurs from time to time. So that's our look at a public policy. The next, uh, the next uh, um, presentation, we'll look at taxing and spending. So we're going to be into 16. But this is the this is kind of the end all for 15, which is why we're kind of racing through it as we head down toward the wire of the uh, of getting done with the semester and taking the AP exam. So thank you for listening and be ready for <coughs> excuse me, the next one that will be uh, uploaded tomorrow night.